So recently I did a short talking about uh, you might be leaving performance on the table by not enabling XMP slash DOCP or Expo uh, for your system. But one thing you might notice is uh, it's not gonna work on all systems. It's not always guaranteed to work. So today we're gonna talk about why your XMP or extreme profile memory, whatever it's called for whichever platform you're running, isn't working. Some steps you can take to try and make it work and how to revert and uh, get your system up and running again if it's stuck in a boot loop crash cycle, whatever. EK Waterblock's quantum torque fittings for PC liquid cooling include static extenders, rotary adapters, offsets, double rotary fittings, and micro series for all small form factor systems. With a wide variety of fittings, your loop building experience becomes much easier, quicker, and more streamlined. And all torque fittings come in four major finish options that will blend in with any setup. The standard nickel plated versions, the special matte black, satin titanium, and fittings plated with real gold. With replaceable locking rings available in multiple colors and aesthetic color rings only available from EK, the customization options are almost endless. To see the full lineup of EK water block torque fittings, follow the link in the description below. So just a short recap though, the memory speeds that are printed on the package are overclocks. The base speed for DDR5 is 4800 megahertz. The base speed for DDR4 I think is 2133 and it might end up being 2333 or 2400 as it matured a little bit later. But obviously this 6400 megahertz kit of RAM is uh, much higher than the base clock of 4800 megahertz. So if I was to just take this RAM, put it in my system and turn on the system, it would run at the absolute base settings and base timings for DDR5, which is the uh, 4800 megahertz. But DDR4 is where you're gonna probably notice more of an issue about not being able to run uh, XMP or DOCP. Let's do a quick sidebar here. DOCP is what the quote unquote AMD sort of qualified timings and, and speeds were for like Ryzen systems for like Ryzen 1000 up through 5000. And then with AM5 and 7000 series Ryzen, they changed the name to AMD Expo. So XMP stands for Extreme Memory Profile and that was specifically for like Intel based CPUs. And it's been called XMP or Extreme Memory Profile now for a long, long time, like way more than a decade, uh, probably closer to two decades now at this point. But anyway, I digress. DOCP was just sort of what the motherboard manufacturers sort of made to qualify RAM that was designed to work with Intel to work on their motherboards with AMD CPUs. Now the thing about the DOCP slash XMP or Expo now, which is a uh, like an AMD sort of vetted qualified RAM speed, if you will, um, is it's not guaranteed to work on your system. You see, well, ever since the memory controller, the MC or the memory controller was moved off of the North Bridge or off of the chipset and onto the CPU, it became much, much harder for CPUs to overclock as well as run memory overclocks. So if we're talking about enabling our XMP and you wanna play around with memory timings and speeds, cause it's not just changing the frequency. Like on here, it says 6,400 megahertz. Are the timings listed on here? No, they're not listed on this package. What you're gonna notice is it's gonna increase the memory clock speeds as well as tighten up all of the timings. So it's not guaranteed to work on all systems because the memory controller, depending on your CPU's ASIC quality and its silicon lottery scale, if you will, uh, is going to vary between CPU to CPU. So your CPU only guarantees to be able to run the RAM at its base clock settings. And it's only guaranteed to do that at stock CPU settings because that's the condition at which they can guarantee that every single CPU shipped across the world is going to be able to operate just standard, basic out of the box settings. It's so when you start enabling AI overclocking or motherboard enhanced features and memory overclocking, which is again, these profiles we're talking about, then you'll, that you'll start to notice some uh, instabilities. And those instabilities can really sort of manifest in a bunch of different ways. Everything is as severe as your system straight up won't post, or you're noticing boot cycles or boot loops where your system powers off, powers on, powers off, powers on. It could be as subtle as random blue screens here and there in your system playing certain games or just what seems to be completely random crashes, blue screens, crash to desktops, um, or even stuttering and stuff taking place in your system. There's, there's a possibility where the stability can be just so on the razor's edge that only very specific type of situations could potentially give the blue screen. And that blue screen would just be the fact that the memory made some sort of a mathematical error or the CPU made some sort of mathematical error and then it was not harsh enough to cause a full system hang or freeze, but enough to trigger a blue screen. 
So these are some of the things that you might notice when you start playing around with your RAM overclocks. So enabling your RAM overclock though is pretty simple. The first thing you have to, or I say RAM overclock, obviously profiles. First thing you have to do is restart your system and get into your system's BIOS. So in my Falcon Northwest system here, this is the Talon. I have a 14900K and 32 gigabytes of HyperX Fury uh, RGB RAM rated at 6,000 megahertz. Uh, so if I wanted to enable that XMP profile for the Intel system, then it would just show up right here as XMP. What you might notice too is it may even show up called XMP and in, in AMD systems. But the bottom line is if you are on auto, then it's gonna be default running at the lowest speeds. Now you'll notice a couple of different profiles here, XMP1, XMP2, and XMP tweaked. Some of those are gonna be motherboard uh, settings that are on there by default by the motherboard manufacturer. So like this is an Asus board, so I know Asus does a lot of vetting on RAM that is stable uh, at certain CPU speeds and stuff. And the way they do that is, and I know like MSI and Gigabyte and, and ASRock and all of them do the same thing. They have a lab with hundreds of systems. And then they basically just go through and do what's called a QVL. And I think QVL stands for quality verification list. But what they do is they take as much RAM off of, you know, from the manufacturers as they can, different speeds, different timings. Uh, and then they kind of determine what is stable and what isn't. So they might come up with alternative profiles here that are, that you can try if XMP1 or profile one isn't stable. So you're not necessarily finding different XMP profiles that exist on the RAM itself, but different profiles that exist based on what the motherboard says would be an alternative to try if your CPU won't post or run stable at its uh, printed speeds. So let's go ahead and enable XMP right here. It's already enabled, but you'll notice the timing show right here, which is 32, 38, 38, and 80. What I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna reset my optimized defaults. And this system does actually have a very stable overclock as well, running 6,000 megahertz memory. Um, but what I wanna show you is how the actual memory speeds, so you have your DRAM frequency right here, which shows all these different, you might be wondering why some are grayed out. I've had this question before. This is because they have to run in a certain ratio. Um, these ran, these speeds that are grayed out are just out of ratio with the, uh, the actual memory controller. So they just show every, possible iteration of the speed, but only the white ones are valid based on uh, the memory controller and the ratio needed. But as you can see right here, it, it would let you go to some really dumb numbers if you wanted. Like there's 13,333, I don't, again, it's just ratio, it's just math, right? So it's just like, how far can it go? I don't know. Changing the frequency is only half of that equation. So like I said, we'll go back up to, leave it at auto, like where it was. Let's take a look though at the timings. You'll notice now at stock, uh, we still have the 32, 38, 38, 38, and 80. That's because that's what we're currently booted in. But if I go ahead right now and put all of these timings back to auto, I wanna see how much our RAM timings change. And believe it or not, RAM timing, more often than not, has a um, bigger impact on the overall performance of the RAM than just the overall RAM megahertz. So you notice the timing's loosened up a little bit. Ironically, CHA and CHB down here on the RAS uh, time actually tightened. It was So sometimes when you go really fast with the RAM, you have to loosen the timings a little bit. Um, and as you can see here, they loosened up to 80 from 76, but they tightened up you know, up here on the cast latency from 40 to 38, et cetera, et cetera. But let's go ahead and do a calculation right here. Let's see right now at 4,800 megahertz at uh, CL40, Let's see what our actual effective mega transfers are of the RAM. And I want this way we can show you calculation wise how sometimes if you have to loosen the timings too much, uh, you lose performance. So 4800 at CL40 is getting us 16.66 nanoseconds of calculated latency. That shows you how fast RAM is. <laughs> so we're measuring in nanoseconds now. Um, but anyway, so 6400 megahertz, I, I thought this was 6000, 6400 megahertz at CL32 is 10 nanoseconds versus 16.6666 at stock. So you can see now in terms of overall performance, we are only a little bit faster or a little bit slower than twice as fast in terms of latency. So this is why timing is important. So 6400 at CL32. I'm just gonna go ahead and let this post with those timings. I'm then gonna artificially make it not boot so you guys can see uh, what to do to get it back. Can't decide between performance or noise optimization for your next PC case? Then Be Quiet has you covered with their new Dark Base Pro 901. The interchangeable top and front cover allow you to choose either maximum airflow or virtually inaudible operation. 
Fan brackets with integrated hubs and pogo connectors make cable management easier than it's ever been, while a touch-sensitive front I.O. panel provides state-of-the-art operation. To see the full list of specs of the Be Quiet Dark Base Pro 901, see our full breakdown video at the link in the description below. Now one thing I failed to mention that you should do prior to doing this, like I said, is make sure that any of your overclocks for your CPU are at stock. You never, ever, ever want to change more than one variable when you're overclocking, whether it be RAM or CPU, that way you can keep track of what change caused what result. So if you were to enable XMP and then go in and do a big old overclock on your CPU and you won't post, how do you know if it's CPU? How do you know if it's memory? You don't. I just realized these are 48 gig sticks in here. Holy cow. The Falcon Northwest really hooked up this machine. <laughs> I just assumed they were 32 gigs because 16 gigs times two kits are like really common. Uh, anyway, the Hyper Fury X is available, or the Fury Renegade is available all the way up to 8,000 mega transfers. So that's kind of crazy. Anyway, with that said, let's see if this kit can go 8,000 mega transfers. Well, we might as well just make it no, go with something we know is not going to work because one of the things I'm not going to do is touch voltage. Okay, there we go. This should not post. If it does, that's crazy. If the motherboard does its job, it should recognize that it's not posting because of memory problems, revert to safe mode and get you back into the BIOS. So it's doing several post attempts here, which is indicative of when, well, we got video. This is usually what you'll notice if RAM is not working. So it just did a restart again right there, code 12, code 28. It'll hang on 31 for a minute, then go to 34, then SC, probably zero, zero, and then restart, says so 4C, zero D. This is all memory stuff right here. Um, if it were to post, uh, there's the 31, it's gonna hang. This is now its third restart. So I'm hoping the board will recognize that we can't get past the memory stage and then uh, it should hopefully revert itself into a safe mode. Fortunately, this motherboard has a button on the back that's a clear CMOS button. Yeah, so there's another full on restart. I keep hoping it would come back on the safe mode, but clearly it doesn't want to. So this is perfect. We're just going to flip the power supply switch. Okay, power down and then so the clear CMOS button on this guy is just a little button that sticks out. I'm gonna, you don't technically have to turn off the power supply. Clearing the CMOS, when you push the clear CMOS button, in the old days and old power supplies, you'd have to take the CMOS battery out. Otherwise the CMOS clear wouldn't work because technically what it's doing is it's kind of like draining all of the caps to get all of the volatile memory in it to sort of reset. That way it goes back into a first boot up startup type of a state. So on older boards, you might even have a jumper that you have to jumper with a piece of metal or a little, uh, jumper plastic deal itself to uh, with two pins on your board. So you had to look at your manual to figure out where that jumper is. Now when you push the clear CMOS button, it does all that for you. So you technically don't have to turn off the power supply, but I do it anyway, because it doesn't hurt. Now it's gonna be just like the very first boot you ever did when you built your system, assuming you built it. Or uh, it'd be the very same boot up as like when your SI built it, the very first time they built it. So now what we should get is if I just let it go, we should end up with an, like an American Megatrends type of a BIOS flash uh, or a splash screen here. That's gonna basically say um, reset detected, push F1 to enter BIOS or like another button to continue. It'll probably force me into BIOS. And um, that's all assuming this reset worked. <laughs> Should default to BIOS. Yep, see there it is. There's your Mega Mega Trends right there. The system has posted in safe mode. Well, I made it go to safe mode. It didn't do it on its own. Anyway, F1, back into the BIOS. So there we go. That's pretty much it. We're just gonna re-enable XMP1 without the 6,700 or, or 8,000 <laughs> Mega Transfers. I could probably get a little more out of this, but there's no point, honestly. There becomes a real diminishing returns on how fast the memory is going if you're not doing tasks that are swapping with memory real, like real frequently. So anyway, there you go. Um, like I said, the only thing that may differ for your system and what we just sort of showed you here is the fact that one, you might have uh, a CPU that won't run anything at all above st stock. We've had a couple of those come through here before. We've had some CPUs that are just real duds when it comes to the IO controller on the CPU. Um, Ryzen, prior to like 3000 series, so like 1000 series Ryzen and 2000 series Ryzen, which is first and second gen of when Ryzen first came out, those were the most sensitive when it came to RAM speeds. And most of the time you would not be able to run anywhere near the posted XMP slash DOCP profile. And that was because of the way that the Infinity Fabric for the memory and IO controller had not matured fast enough to be able to really take advantage of fast RAM. And the RAM had to stay within a very specific ratio with the fabric itself. So 
that's, you're gonna notice on the older platform for Ryzen, it was really, really picky and finicky. But the faster the RAM, the better for AMD specifically because of the Infinity Fabric. So the very thing that needed the fast RAM was also what was limiting how fast it could go. Uh, on more modern CPUs like 10th gen and up Intel, like 10th gen Intel, I was definitely not able to run like the crucial DDR4, um, 5,000 megahertz DDR4 that I had. And that's very fast for, for DDR4. But Intel uh, 11th gen was able to run it just fine. Out of the box, enable XMP and it was perfectly fine. And that was because of the increased uh, stability of the next generation CPU's memory controller. The other thing too is you're gonna find that motherboard manufacturers do keep a QVL list of what RAM kits are designed to work and known to work with their motherboards and uh, CPU list. So always cross-reference cross the QVL with the motherboard manufacturer um, with not just the memory company and the amount of memory and the speed, but the actual like kit name, like the serial number and all that stuff, like the part number is what will be um, QVL verified. Because you can't, in modern CPUs, you really can't take two matching kits that are like exactly the same part number and everything and throw them together and say, now I've got a quad dim setup because what you'll find is that there's variance between the DIMMs themselves. And so Corsair, for instance, would have a four stick kit that all four of those RAMs have, RAM sticks have been kind of verified to work together. And then you still have to verify that with the QVL list for the motherboard manufacturer. So RAM has gotten a bit complicated over the last couple gens simply because of the fact that the quantity of the RAM per DIMM now and ddr 5s still ongoing maturity, because uh, it's, it's super immature right now. It just just tells distasteful jokes. Anyway, moving on. It's still taking time for DDR5. It's only been out for two years now to continue to improve. And what you'll notice too is that new BIOS that come up from other boards will often include new profiles to make newer RAM kits that have come out after the previous iterations of the motherboard versionings or BIOS uh, had supported. A kit that may not have been supported initially is maybe supported now with one of those tweaked profiles. All right, I hope this has answered some question regarding RAM. I get this question a lot about why their system just won't run XMP or, or Expo. Unfortunately, it's not guaranteed. It's one of, the why, one of the reasons why my buying advice is never to go with like the fastest RAM ever for your system because it's a real hit or miss on whether or not you'll be able to do it. One thing I would have done if 6400 would not post on this system if it were, if, if that was the max speed 6400, I would leave XMP on all those timings and then I would drop it to like 6200. And if that wasn't stable, I would drop it down to the next white number and then find where the maximum mega transfers were stable and then run that. So that's, you can always get usually something above base, but it's not guaranteed. All right guys, thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.